So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and why you started this uh, I'm Damu Smith, founder and co-chair of Black Voices for Peace. And Black Voices for Peace was founded to organize a progressive black community response to the tragic events of 9-11-2001, and more specifically to respond to what we consider the ill-conceived response of the Bush administration to those tragic events. And so we've been focusing on the need to have a U.S. foreign policy that is forged in peace and respect for human rights and dignity and support for people struggling for democracy and human rights around the world, and for a progressive domestic, domestic policy that addresses uh, funding essential human needs and supporting democracy here at home. Okay, and uh, leading into the, to the war in Iraq, what kind of uh, actions were, was Black Forces for Peace involved in? Well, we've been involved in mobilizing for all of the major protests that have been held in Washington, D.C., and New York City, and we've organized our own protests, primarily here in the Washington metropolitan area. We've been trying to make sure that the African American community and the black community interculturally is integrally involved in all of these activities. Um, we think it's important for the black community to be involved because we need the black voice in interpreting, analyzing, uh, helping people to understand what is going on and why we people in this country, working class people, poor people, women, people of color, uh, young people, why we all need to be coming together to challenge the dangerous and reckless policies of this administration. The black community tends to see things often through a different lens than white people, for example, because we've had a different experience. Our churches have been bombed, our leaders have been lynched and assassinated, We've had church burnings. We had the civil rights movement, which was trying to address the issue of uh, desegregating public accommodations. All of these things have led to a perspective that lends towards people in our community being more suspicious of whatever the government does. So all of the polls, for example, show that if you look at who's against Bush, we have the highest polling numbers against Bush. We have the highest polling numbers against the war. We have the highest polling numbers for peace abroad. And our job as Black Voices for Peace has been to organize that sentiment, to ensure that we would not only sentimentally uh, correct on the issues, but organizationally working to mobilize people to take action to address these issues. And when you look at the, uh, oh, let me just ask you, are you hearing a lot of that? Is it, it's not okay. It's all right. It's okay. When you, when you look at the performance of the, the print and television news media leading up to the war in Iraq, can you kind of uh, give an evaluation of the media's performance of incorporating a lot of skeptical viewpoints? The mainstream media has absolutely been horrible. They have been cheerleaders for the Bush administration's policies. They were not just embedded, but in bed with the U.S. military and the Bush administration when both entities launched the war and occupation against Iraq. You cannot be objective. You cannot give a, an independent analysis if you are riding in a tank or an anti-personnel carrier or a jeep and living with the very military that's carrying out the occupation and the intervention. And so what happened was the American people were viewing television screens as if they were watching a movie and the, instead of real war, because the media embedded with the military, were there to tell a story, not so much about the story behind the war, the story underlying the war, getting at the root causes of the war, and critically critiquing the causes of the war. The military was acting as if um, there was this drama movie, uh, this war movie being portrayed. And so they talked about tanks going into the battlefield and what, the, what conditions the troops were, were under. And don't get me wrong, I'm concerned about what conditions our troops are under. But this war was a war fought for oil. It was fought for the interests of the oligarchy of this country and the Bush administration. It was not fought because of weapons of mass destruction. It was not fought because there was a connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. But these are the things that the Bush administration said were the reasons for war and more, and the media went along with this. So they became a cheerleader for the war, and reporters accompanied our troops 
and portrayed it as if it was some sort of um, television show and docudrama as opposed to a real war that had underlying political currents that needed to be understood. And that was the problem that we've been dealing with. So the, the, the media in this country helped to whip up passion for the war. The media became central to everything the Bush administration was doing. Without the media, I do not believe the Bush administration could have gotten away with this war. So the media is culpable, the mainstream media. Thank God for independent progressive media like Pacifica Radio and others that did everything possible to expose what this war was really about. Shame on the mass media, major media in this country. And, uh, can you turn like a half an inch this way? Because when okay. he's his hands, he's coming off screen. Oh, okay. so oh I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting excited. <laughs> yeah. Just like a half inch towards you. Towards me? This way? Yeah, or, towards you. Okay, turn yeah. this way a little bit. Me? Yeah, okay. just yeah, so that. that's better. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, um, in my particular project that I'm working on right now, I'm stopping at March 19th, which is the beginning of the war. So kind of uh, talk about uh, leading up to the war. Were you in dialogue with a lot of the uh, um, mainstream media, the print press, corporate press? What kind of reactions were you getting from uh, the media uh, in, in, in trying to get some... Well, we, we were primarily in touch with the Washington Post and the New York Times. We organized two protests against the Washington Post for its editorializing for the war, for its um, journalistic exclusion policy of not really reporting on what the anti-war movement was doing, and more specifically about what people of color in the black community was doing to oppose the war. We were in communication with the New York Times because the New York Times uh, had this article, I, I never forget this, the Sunday after a major uh, ANSA-sponsored protest that we were a part of uh, near the Vietnam War Memorial. And they gave these reports on these low numbers of people that attended. There were thousands of people out there. And so we got in touch with the New York Times and we tried to find out what was going on. Why did you uh, uh, incorrectly report the numbers that were at the protest? And of course, the New York Times joined you know, National Public Radio and some other public publications in misreporting how many people were there. There were thousands of people there. They gave these low numbers, just a few hundred disinterested people, that kind of thing. So we were very angry about the role of the press and we began to protest. And like I said, we staged two protests outside of the Washington Post. We were able to uh, uh, confront uh, Ben Bradley, one of the people in the higher echelons of the Post, and say to him, why are you editorializing for this war? So we were, we were out there uh, protesting. We also uh, we're mobilizing people to protest uh, efforts by the Federal Communications Commission to further consolidate media monopolization of the nation's airwaves, which of course was a problem for us because the media, as I've said before, has been a principal cheerleader for the policies of this administration, and further media consolidation would mean further viewing of uh, uh, attitudes and opinions from the mass media standpoint that excluded voices of the anti-war movement, voices from the black community, progressive voices, and non-mainstream players who were advocating a different foreign policy for our country. And did you watch a lot of the, uh, I'm, I'm focusing specifically on ABC, CBS, and NBC, and I'm yes. wondering if you watched any of the, that, the coverage during the build-up to the war and kind of your response to that? Their coverage. Oh yes, I, I watched uh, all of the coverage, in, including CNN. Um, you know, I, I had this experience um, uh, a few weeks after the war started where I appeared on CNN primetime with uh, Paul Lazan. And, you know, an hour before I appeared on the show, they were doing this teaser trying to set me up saying that, was the anti-war movement wrong about the war? Because the polling numbers, according to them, were very high by the American people for the war. And what I said at the time, and I reiterate now, was that the American people were fed a diet of pro-war uh, anti-Iraq uh, sentiment that helped to mobilize people for the war. So I was very skeptical about the uh, polling numbers, and if the polling numbers were indeed correct, they had a lot to do with the fact that people were being spoon-fed the policies and the viewpoint of the administration. Uh, that's what we saw in ABC News, NBC News. They were bringing in these, um, these former retired generals, people who had just left the military, and they were using them on these 
these high-tech uh, visuals that were being shown. They would show the bombs being dropped, and they would show these things exploding on these uh, grainy black and white uh, uh, video screens. And so what we were seeing was we were not seeing casualties. We were not seeing Iraqi casualties. We were not seeing children burn. We were not seeing men, women, and children dying and being dumped into mass graves. We were not seeing U.S. soldiers screaming and hollering when they were shot or maimed or wounded. So we were seeing none of this. And again, the media participated in this, so they continued to run the line of the administration about the reason we had to go to war. They, again, re uh, reported on the war as if it were a docudrama rather than a real war. And three, they never showed visually the true impact of war, the horrific things that happen when you wage a war, the destruction of human life and the destruction of property. And can you speak to uh, your perception of of how this, this administration views international law, views the UN, and, and why is international law important? <laughs> well, this administration has a complete disregard for international law and international institutions. The effort by the, the so-called effort by the United States to get approval of the United Nations for the war in Iraq was a complete farce. First of all, they were tapping the phones of UN officials. They were engaged in discrediting uh, the United Nations uh, weapons inspectors, inspectors team that was on the ground in Iraq just before the war. Um, they continued to criticize and oppress countries like uh, France and Germany and others who were opposed to the war. So uh, on the one hand, you, you had this dance, this fake farce dance by the United States acting as if uh, through Colin Powell being a mouthpiece for the administration, acting as if they were serious about getting international support, when in fact, the Bush administration had already decided they were going to war no matter what the United Nations said. And they created a set of circumstances where uh, it would be difficult for the United Nations to go along with what the United States wanted anyway so, so that they could go to war. So the United States went to war on false pretenses. They ran the United Nations weapons inspectors that the United States sought to totally discredit out of the country because they didn't want the UN weapons inspectors to be there because they thought that they wouldn't find anything. So the best thing to do according to this administration was to defy international opinion and the United Nations. The millions of people who are protesting in the streets of Europe and Africa and Asia and Latin America and in the United States defy everyone and go to war because this administration was committed to one thing, regime change. It was never about a connection between Iraq and Al Qaeda. It was never about uh, weapons of mass destruction. They knew there were no weapons of mass destruction, but they wanted to have control politically and economically over that region and over the oil fields in Iraq. And uh, why is international law important? International law is important because those are the instruments that we use to help maintain peace and stability in the world and to resolve international disputes. War is old-fashioned stuff that never works. War kills, war destroys, war maims, war traumatizes nations and peoples. We have to rely on the United Nations and international law and international instruments that are aimed at resolving conflict between nations and peoples. Without that, the entire world would be in chaos. But when you have countries like the United States and Israel, I might add, that love to defy international law and international opinion and do whatever they want to wreak havoc on peoples, then the world is in constant danger and in less secure. And today, the people of the United States and the entire world are less secure because of the policies of the United States and Israel that continue to defy international law and ignore it. And uh, a lot of people on the right say, you know, everyone else is doing, no one else follows international law. You know, France isn't, no one does. So. You know, talk to you know your kind of response to there's no sovereign authority to actually enforce these rules. Well, you know, of course there are countries that defy international law besides the United States. But here's the point: without a commitment on the part of nations and peoples and groups to try to enforce international law and to work to ensure that international law is respected, we are guaranteed to have a world constantly and permanently at war. There are many defects in the United Nations system. There are many defects in the global system of jurisprudence aimed at addressing conflicts. 
Our job as activists in this country is to work to educate the American people and the people of the world about international law, the value that international law has to resolve in international uh, disputes, and to ensure that we are actively engaged by pressuring our own government to respect international law and to get other groups to do the same in their respective countries. That's the only insurance that we have that international law and international processes will work. And when you look at the, the buildup to the war in Iraq and you look at the coverage of the news media, you talk about how they did or did not incorporate skeptical viewpoints in their day-to-day -day beat coverage. Well, they didn't... They, they I'm sorry, I'm not going to be including my question, so if you could... Well, well here's the problem. Uh, uh, the media, the mainstream media, has never wanted to feature alternative points of view. Uh, and when they do present alternative points of view, it's always within a certain box genre of people. For example, they'll have members of Congress, perhaps, uh, expressing a different point of view. But they're not going to have Damu Smith. They're not going to have Leslie Kagan. They're not going to have Brian Becker. These are all leaders of the anti-war movement. They're not going to have our perspective, all right? And so we get excluded from Meet the Press. We get excluded from ABC News uh, Tonight, ABC News Sunday. We get excluded from um, um, you know, all of the talk shows on Sunday mornings. You never see representatives of the anti-war movement. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. You never see representatives of the anti-war movement in the media on these morning talk shows. They won't have us. This despite the fact we are the ones who are mobilizing millions of people in the streets all the time. We do have some influence. We are shapers and molders of public opinion, yet they don't invite us to speak. And this is a deliberate policy on the part of the mainstream media to ensure that the American people would not have the benefit of our perspective and our point of view and the knowledge and expertise that we bring to the table. I would love, for example, to debate Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, President Bush, Dick Cheney, but the media is afraid of this because they know that we will ask the tough questions that they will never ask. And this is the problem with the mass media in this country. They are afraid for true democracy. And do you see that a lot of the, um, the debate of he shed, she shed is only from Democrats and Republicans and if anything outside of that point of view is... Absolutely. It's, it's Democrats versus Republicans or some independent Republican versus another Republican. It's never us. So you see a rotation of the same people every week. You see John McCain on there all the time. You see these, you know, Arlen inspector on there all the time. You see the same people being recycled every week on these broadcasts. So the American people, they don't have a clue about what we're thinking unless they see us on C-SPAN or on independent media. I tell you, the media has pursued, the mainstream media in this country has pursued what I consider the most unethical, criminal, undemocratic policy you could ever have because they deliberately exclude the voices of people that could help determine the outcome of other people's point of view and other people's action. It is deliberate and it is designed to ensure complicity in the policies of the current regime by the American people by misinforming them and by making sure that don't, they don't hear another point of view. That is not a democracy. That is not democracy at all, and the media is playing a role in denying people their democratic right to hear other points of view. We do not live in a democracy. We live in a limited democracy dominated by those with the money and those with the capital to afford to go on TV and be heard. And when, you, when you look at the actual uh, days of the protest, usually it's on a Saturday, in the media, they will cover it, but they and talk about the nature of the coverage. You know, to, to me, they seem that it covers a photo op, not talk about the substance, and they, you know, and then it's forgotten after that. So, can you speak to that a little bit? Oh well, yeah, and and let me just say, um, you know, after a lot of protesting and phone calls and letters, the media began to do a little bit of a better job of covering us, but they never reached the point where they needed to reach. Uh, we were called, the anti-war movement that is, the other great, the world's other great superpower when the protests of uh, February 2003 occurred when you had thousands of people out in the streets of New York and San Francisco when United for Peace and Justice and other groups you know, organized that protest. But the, but the media 
uh, the Washington Post, I never forget, uh, I believe, uh, I could be wrong on this, but I believe that they, they sort of put that on page 15 of, of the A section or something like that. It still never got the kind of coverage that it needed to have. That is, that demonstration that took place in February of 2003. So while we were covered, we still were never covered in terms of what we were saying about the analysis behind the war. We were the ones raising questions about weapons of mass destruction. We were the ones that were disagreeing, saying there was no connection between Iraq and um, Al-Qaeda. We were saying those things. We were raising the questions, but members of the Democratic Party were going along with the program, saying now that they were misled by the administration. They were misled because they didn't ask the right questions. We were asking the right questions. We were leading anti-war anti protests, asking the right questions at the same time. Yet again, our voices were not being heard, and what we were doing was not being properly analyzed by the media whenever they reported on us anyway. And can you talk about you know, the skepticism that you had towards the case of weapons of mass destruction? Some people listening would say, well, how do you know? You're not an expert. You're not there. Well, there were a set of circumstances that led to our suspicions. Number one, the UN weapons inspectors hadn't found anything. Remember, they were still there. They were still searching. And they had incredible access to major institutions in Iraqi society this time around. So they were on the ground searching. And Iraq was beginning to destroy some of their so-called long-range missiles just weeks before the war. So of course, they weren't finding anything. And when Colin Powell went before the United Nations and he told these elaborate, sophisticated lies, I went on BET. Now, I'll never forget this. Remember, BET is now under the jurisdiction of CBS News. I raised questions about Colin Powell's presentation. I said, we have heard the Secretary of State's presentation, and now we need to have third-party review of everything he said. I raised questions about those voices that were heard on those tapes that were played that allegedly were Iraqi military personnel saying things, uh, trying to figure out how to uh, hide uh, weapons when UN weapons inspectors were about to approach. I said on the media then, those could have been CIA agents planted by the United States to say those things. Why was, why was I raising those questions? Because I know that in the past, the Central Intelligence Agency has misled the American people time and time again to justify interventions in Latin America and Asia and other parts of the world. So we had good reason to doubt what the administration was saying and what the CIA was saying based on past history. Lawmakers on the Hill, if they were smart enough, and wise enough and principled enough would have raised the same kinds of questions they didn't. So I don't want to hear this talk about they were misled. They misled themselves and they, and they fell for that. And uh, you know, when I read uh, Media Research uh, Center, which is kind of the more the conservative right-wing media criticism, they'll, they'll look at the anti-war rally and, and I think there's even legitimate debates within the left that it's very split and diverse. So you have you know, at an anti-war rally, a whole broad spectrum of opinions. And then, uh, so can you talk about the, the diversity even within the anti-war movement and, and how, uh, since the Bush administration wasn't really being clear, there was a lot of, in a way, conspiracy theories or theories of trying to figure out why we were going to go to war broad, you know, with a broad spectrum. So can you just... Okay, so yeah, talk a little bit about the nature of the diversity even within the anti-war movement throughout the broad spectrum of opinions? Well, um, we do have a diverse anti-war movement. Uh, we have people within the anti-war movement who are considered very much to the left of the political spectrum. Answer gets that label uh, as a description, uh, international answer. Uh, you have, and you know, they, they tend to be more um, overtly and unapologetically anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, and they'll say that in their literature and in their publications. At the same time, you know, they are a group that try, has tried to reach out to broader segments of people uh, to be part of their efforts. You know, and then you have other organizations like the American Friends Service Committee, the National Council of Churches, that tend not to be as um, overtly and explicitly, uh, rhetorically anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist, although in their actions, they, they clearly are. It's a matter of how people speak about situations in the world and how we analyze situations in the world and how we choose to use language to mobilize people. And I think 
the issues around Israel and Palestine, for example, is one which has um, divided the anti-war movement or kept us sometimes in conflict with one another about how to project the issue of Palestine in the context of doing work around Iraq and work around Afghanistan and work around other issues like Latin America. So you, we do have a wide range of voices within the anti-war movement. But I have to tell you, with all the problems uh, or, or, or divisions that might exist, we were able to mobilize thousands, millions of people, forging unity at the right moment to do what we needed to do to be effective and to get people out. Unfortunately, it didn't stop the war. It did slow the war down. It did force the United States to play like it wanted to go to the United Nations. Um, we were able to educate and mobilize um, thousands of people. And we have to continue to uh, grow those seeds that were planted during that time to really truly powerful and effective anti-war movement for the long haul, for the work that has to be done uh, beyond this administration. And uh, part of International Answers acronym is to, you know, they want to end racism. Can you, and, and to some people that may not make sense necessarily in the context of Iraq. So can you kind of elaborate on, on issues of racism in Iraq? Oh, absolutely. You know, racism is a key tenet of uh, U.S. imperial policy around the world, U.S. military interventionist policy around the world. If you look at where most of the last major wars were fought, where were they fought? They were fought in Asia, for example, in the Middle East, specifically in Korea, uh, in Vietnam, uh, in Iraq, in Latin America, many other countries. Most of these are non-white, uh, non-European countries. Uh, one kept, can't help but wonder, would the United States be dropping bombs on white people in the same way they are so quick to drop bombs, napalm, and other weapons of mass, and use other weapons of mass destruction um, as they have done on people of color? This is a very serious issue, and Dr. King talked about the need to, quote unquote, uh, integrate our foreign policy. And what we, he meant was that we needed to have the perspective of people of color. Unfortunately, we have an administration that has found people of color like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell who actually um, carry the water for the administration and uh, are doing the dirty deeds, helping to do the dirty deeds of this administration. But what we do need are more voices of people of color who can bring a perspective to the foreign policy debate and the public policy discourse in this country that talks about racism and the history of this country and, what, and the role that racism has played in forging U.S. policy, for example, towards South Africa during all those years in which the apartheid regime, the white supremacist apartheid regime was in power and the United States provided economic support for them and how the United States provided millions of dollars through the Central Intelligence Agency to the UNITA represent Angola wreaking havoc on their country and how the United States provided uh, weapons to Mobutu, a dictator in Africa at the expense of thousands of lives of Africans in that country who have suffered and, and really been in pain and agony during the years of that brutal regime that the United States supported for geopolitical reasons. So we have a lot to talk about in terms of the race, the role that racism has played in, in, in U.S. policy. And the recent examples of the treatment of the Iraqi prisoners are, are recent examples, fresh examples of how racism functions. Most of those GIs, not all of them, but most of them who were carrying out those dirty deeds against Iraqi prisoners were white. And what we've heard from the uh, analysts who have looked closely into the situation is that most of those white soldiers, most of those U.S. soldiers who were doing those dirty things, those horrible things against Iraqis, you know, stripping them naked, um, having them engage in sex acts and that kind of thing, they had very negative attitudes about them as Arab people. They looked at them like they were dogs. And when you think of people as dogs and less than human, you tend to treat them in that way. And that's what we have seen in terms of what U.S. troops have been doing on the ground in Iraq. Okay. And let me see if there's another. Uh, Fun, can you kind of describe your vision of world peace and what we need to do to get there? Well, we've got to have justice in order to have peace. I mean, you know, this slogan that you've heard come out of primarily the black community over the past several years, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. It has real, deep, principled meaning in the context of our lives. Whenever there has been a violent rebellion in the black communities of the United States or in the Latino communities or in the Native American communities, it has been because 
a police officer shot a black man or a Native American or a Latino because there's been no justice in terms of how the police treat people of color. Whenever workers don't have just wages, there's a strike, there's a protest, and the police respond. And all around the world where people are under the yoke of colonialism and oppression and their human rights are being violated, there is violence. And so from the perspective of Black Voices for Peace, we understand very clearly that until the people of the world in every country of the world has true justice, equality, freedom, and their human rights are respected, there will be no peace and stability in the world or in any country or in any neighborhood or family or community. War comes about in most cases because someone perceives or is actually experiencing a gross injustice being inflicted in the situation and poverty and, and uh, uh, national oppression and racial discrimination and ethnic cleansing and occupation are things that bring about violence. In, in Palestine, is, the Israel is occupying Palestinians. They are, they're, they're causing them to suffer and to be humiliated. That's why we have suicide bombers. It's not, it's not to uh, justify them. It's just to explain the Palestinian people are desperate for their liberation because they're under such massive, incredible, painful humiliation by the Israelis who, who bulldoze their homes, uproot their olive trees, shoot innocent children and shoot children who are throwing stones at tanks. We cannot expect that people will be responsive in any different way than what the Palestinians are doing to respond to the evil, systemic, barbaric, criminal occupation that the Israeli government is carrying out against those people. So until we have justice, everywhere in the world, there will never be any peace. That's our perspective. We have to have our country supporting justice, human rights, democracy for all people, ensuring that people have enough to eat, people have adequate housing, and people's fundamental rights are being respected. That is not occurring throughout the world. In fact, we on the other hand, the United States, we are supporting most of the despotic, repressive, racist regimes around the world that are impoverishing people, discriminating against people, and engaging in policies of ethnic cleansing and rape as a weapon of war. When we do that, we create more instability in the world, and that's why we have to have a vision that talks about support for democracy and human rights as a key to preventing war and violence in the world and maintaining stability everywhere. Okay, great. Let me just get um, like 10 seconds of uh, some room telling here. Um, 10 seconds of? Just quiet. Oh, okay. <laughs> room telling, sorry. Room telling, okay.